All right, welcome back to The Real Money Show. We're very excited to be in the presence by phone with Nomi Prinz. Now, Nomi Prinz is a renowned author, journalist. She's a speaker and TV commentator, and she's joining us today on The Real Money Show. She's worked on Wall Street. She was a senior managing director at Bear Stearns and a managing director at Goldman Sachs before becoming a very fierce advocate for regulatory reform and an educator through best-selling books, including It Takes a Pillage, All the President's Bankers, which we spoke about in our last interview, and now this time around, the book called Collusion, which is a fantastic read. I highly recommend it. And we would like to welcome to the show Nomi Prince. Nomi Prince, welcome back to The Real Money Show. Thank you so much for having me back on. It's really great to have you and uh, to talk about the new book, Collusion. Um, it's a, a fantastic book. I love the way it goes from country to country and just breaks down how they dealt with the crisis from 2008. And I think it's uh, really revealing that um, in 2008, for example, I like how you called the the, the Wall Street bankers rapacious and uh, that uh, somehow the, the ECB and the, the DOJ and the Bank of Mexico somehow just ends up somehow demonstrating allegiance and they somehow become collaborators in an era of money conjuring, as you call it. Um, and that also you note that there is no plan B out there, that these uh, central banks just became part of it. They don't really know how to get out of it. Um, they created a false sense of security, a narrative that everything is somehow normal. And uh, I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit or, or some of your observations or what some of the consequences that people can observe for themselves to understand that just how unconventional things really are because there really is this false sense of security. What can we look to to say, no, no, this is not how it should be? <laughs> well, I, I think the the easiest thing to look at, um, and I've been talking about this a lot very recently because the Fed has um, started to raise rates. Um, like They started to in December of 2015 by 25 basis points, um, but did another two uh, hikes this year and, and others along the way. Um, however, people's savings accounts um, at the largest institutions, that would be the big banks who are the cause of the financial crisis and to whom um, a multi-trillion dollar subsidy, this, this money conjuring strategy, um, really provided their, their own well-being, their own ability to have liquidity when they most needed it, to buy their own stock, to have their stock rise, to have their executives get paid and all of that. Um, they've not even given the benefit of the raise of rates in the United States to their own customers, to, to the people that actually have um, the deposits or savings accounts in their own institution. So, uh, for example, you can open up an online bank uh, savings account um, somewhere near where the Fed funds rate is right now, um, you know, it's between 1.65 to 1.9, depending on how much money you have. Um, some of that's a zero balance. Um, and you can actually receive interest commensurate with the Fed. Um, however, if you have a, an account with any of these large institutions who receive so much help, um, you will not be getting anything near that. Plus, you'll be paying fees likely for that account as well. So that's just one example in everybody's probably home environment in some manner um, that, that shows the real um, benefit that this entire money conjuring, quantitative easing, you know, cheap interest rate policy started by the Fed and then uh, required by the Fed of all of the other major central banks has, has really just hit home in so many different ways. Yeah, and I think one of those things as well, would, would you agree, is that people are just jumping into risky assets. They, they're not, they don't have that access to putting money in the bank and getting interest, as you just said. They're, they're somehow normalized to take risk. That's right. And the problem with, with people for whom that money is kind of their own money, and, I, and what I mean by that is if, if you have savings or, or you have wages, um, that's a one-to-one -one relationship between what you receive and, and what you might want to, to invest that in and what your investment could, could provide you. And if you invest in a savings account, i.e. you keep your money um, in a sort of more conservative fashion and you grow it, you compound interest and everything else, it used to be that that would actually um, you know, provide some some wealth accumulation benefit with, with low risk. But you're right, what's happened is um, because rates have been so low, because there's been this real push um, by the financial community, by, by corporations and so forth to borrow their way into um, more risky assets and to more aggressively play the, the stock markets because the, the, the cost of money is so cheap to them in order to do that, um, 
the result is that we have these bubbles in all of these markets, whether it's debt um, at the government level, the corporate level, emerging markets, people, and so forth, whether it's, you know, stocks, which are um, to a large extent being purchased on the back of quantitative easing money, um, whether that's through share buybacks by companies or banks, or whether that's, you know, purely through leveraging um, that cheap money into into those positions. Um, so we've seen, you know, real uh, yeah, sort of bubbles growing in, in so many different asset classes, and those have risk because the, the risk of a bubble is that it pops. I mean, that's just sort of, you know, the, the nature of, 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 of bubbles. That's that's why we, we use that euphemism is because bubbles can grow and bubbles can pop. When bubbles pop, they tend to pop more quickly than they grow. So So all this chasing right now for riskier assets to provide returns that aren't available um, in more traditional places, um, you know, creating all these bubbles also creates this sort of looming danger that when they pop, all of this sort of artificially uh, created money that the major players use and the real money that people um, are, are putting in on top of that um, can can really uh, ultimately cause some massive losses to to everyone along the way. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we 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 watch, watch these bubbles growing. I want to return just a second to um, the collusion that's happening between the banks because you you one of the major revelations for me when reading the book is you start to look at China and China then looks at at the U.S. and says, "I how can they not have punished those banks?" And I think you you start to see this massive this massive shift happening around the globe. And, and you talk a, a little bit about populism in that sense. But can you talk a little bit about China's role in just being an outsider to what they observed and how they've responded as a result? Yeah, I mean, it should be noted also that China just just very recently, um, you know, has, has basically, you know, thrown or is throwing the, the, head, the equivalent uh, head of their insurance company that was like AIG, which was uh, one of the insurers for a lot of these big banks back in the financial crisis days that got bailed out in order so that the private banks that had worked with them could get bailed out. Um, you know, that guy is, has been given major repercussions and the company's been given repercussions. And, and yes, we don't have that. Um, here we didn't have that in the wake of the financial crisis, nor in the aftermath. And and so one of the things that I noted in in, in China, and I, I spent a lot of time there as as part of the research for this book, is that um, you know they 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 really developed um, a criticism of Federal Reserve policy. This this idea of inflating asset bubbles, of not um, punishing or reforming or restructuring or at least kicking out the heads of um, the institutions that had caused so much um, negativity to the, the not just financial system, but the economy of the United States, and by extension at the time, the world. Um, and they didn't really feel that was <laughs> that 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 really made a whole lot of sense. So in the very beginning of this, of, uh, this past decade, um, the head of the Central Bank of China, Governor Zhao, who's no longer there, he just retired, but he basically became very public in the um, in uh, the IMF forums, you know, throughout the world and, and so forth, and criticizing this idea of not only not punishing these institutions, but rewarding them um, with, with more money and, and less restrictions and allowing them to, to grow and become bigger. Um, and then as a result, uh, criticize the potential of that policy to create bubbles and, and what could happen if those bubbles pop. And that was one of the ways in which China really uh, took advantage of, the, of that policy um, to grow their own footprint in the world, not just economically, um, which they've done, but also from the standpoint of working with other countries who were um, sort of critical as well of, of this policy and potentially being hurt um, by even another financial crisis. And you say, what could happen in the future as well as what happened in the aftermath of this one? Um, and started to work more and more together with like trade alliances and currency relationships and, and everything else. So, so it, it, it took the criticism into sort of action um, with respect to how um, you know it's repositioned itself as a global um, economy and also just you know sort of more of a global player in the monetary system. Now that's not to say that the Chinese rent has replaced the dollar by any means. I mean, there's a lot of talk about you know that potentially being the future. I mean, that's that's not anywhere near where we're at. But but certainly the criticisms um, of the dollar of the Fed of what the system here did from you know a regulatory and non-reform perspective um, have have really um, Echo throughout the rest of the world, um, particularly non G seven countries, um, and and created more alliances between them as a result. Yeah, it's it's sort of uh, I think before this crisis, no one questioned the U S. reserve currency, and now I think that that 
it, it's starting to be questioned is, is, is where we're going. It's not just a leap and a jump to a new world reserve currency, but it certainly starts to, you feel the, the tsunami coming of what could happen, you know, 10 years from now kind of thing. No, that's right. I mean, all, all of that's in play. And, and again, it was, yeah, it's the financial crisis and, and just the, the behavior towards the financial crisis. I mean, even today's Fed, um, not that the Fed has changed that much, it just has a new chair, um, right. you know, is, is talking about um, you're deregulating uh, banks even, even further and that they're healthy and they're fine and everything else, not understanding that the reason they are healthy and fine on the surface is because the Fed has subsidized them uh, for the past 10 years. So, so there remains a disconnect, which again, other countries, I think, um, you know, particularly ones that see themselves on a growth path are, are very cognizant of. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things as well that I noticed in, in within the book is this idea that how emerging economies get just beat up on their currencies all the time because of this event that they never asked for, that they didn't participate in, but now they're having to react to. And I, I for us, I see a role of gold and silver in, in that response we were actually just speaking to uh, the head of our uh, depository and, and bullion dealer who travels all around the globe, and he said that that's why they're all starting to get more into precious metals because of all the fluctuating currencies that are happening as a result. Right. So the um, the idea of the fluctuating currencies and just questioning um, the dollar is a part of that. You know, is is something that I, I think a lot more people have woken up to. Um, in in the aftermath of the financial crisis. I mean, not just in other countries where they have as well, but I mean, also, yes, because um, if you're in a margin market country, and I, I show this um, in the book, you know, you're you're in this position where as a central bank, you're very much more connected to what's happening in your economy um, in terms of where you put rates versus real price inflation, like real cost of like real things for like real people, um, because in general, the financial systems are less leveraged. And so everything actually matters in terms of the cost of money and, um, and protecting currencies. And it's become expensive um, for some of these countries to protect their currencies in, in, in the wake of um, you know, this, this massive force behind the U.S. dollar of the Federal Reserve being able to just sort of create money and, and, and pop up um, the financial markets and the asset markets, which can't really be done uh, to that extent for economic reasons in these other countries. So you sort of develop this whole um, level of additional inequality and instability throughout the world because of this policy, which, again, the Fed um, refuses to acknowledge. I mean, other other multinational sort of central bank entities like the IMF gets it, the Fed doesn't. Um, and so that's a problem. And so if you look at gold and silver, one of the things that um, actually is interesting, I brought up in the book um, as sort of just a byproduct of research was that in the early days of the financial crisis, Ben Bernanke, who was the chair of the Fed at the time, was addressing um, Congress. And he was talking about just the yeah, very, very early days of, of, of uh, quantitative easing and low rates and kind of saying that the economy was already back on track. I mean, this was like, you know, a few months in. <laughs> um, um, but one of the things he chose to say at the time, because um, as I mentioned before, China was already being um, openly critical in other uh, forums. And uh, he said at the time that the one thing that couldn't happen and it was literally not a question he was answering. This just like came out of just, just his remarks um, that we didn't want to either the U.S. get into a situation where we were like China or where we went back to the gold standard. And it was interesting because this was like a defensive uh, statement, which, which came out of not even a reporter's question. I mean, this was literally just him talking. Um, and it's interesting to sort of trace that with, the development of, of, of other currencies and central bank positioning and even their buying of gold um, as, as a potential hedge to the dollar um, in the years that followed. So there is definitely a, a, a fear at the Federal Reserve and in the financial system in the U.S., which is pretty big, which is one of the reasons I think gold hasn't, um, you know, appreciated um, by as much as it being a potential hedge um, commodity or hedge asset should, should make it. Um, or historical, you know, asset of, of, of storing value should make it is because um, there's a real fear at, at the level of the Fed and the financial system in the U.S. of losing that, um, you know, sort of ability to control the main reserve currency in the world and therefore the global economy and, and global markets with the dollar. So it's like there's there's kind of a fight on that side. And then you have these other central banks like Russia, like China, like Brazil, just – 
um, you know, Saudi Arabia and so we are buying gold as, as a way to potentially, um, you know, anchor themselves away from the currency risk of the dollar. So like we're in this tug of war um, going on right now, um, which is, which is again, why I think, you know, these levels uh, for gold and silver are, are, are lower right now, I think, because they're, they're in that tug of war process, but, but there's, but, but the tug or whatever, the pull is coming from the central banks and the countries that want to um, challenge that um, you know, sort of hegemony of the dollar and of, of the U.S. And again, that's a slow process, but I think that's a process that is happening and it has been um, instigated by the aftermath of the financial crisis and, and, and you know, the reactions to it from the U.S., I, I want to get back to, or I want to talk to you a little bit about where you see things happening uh, in terms of, uh, you know, positive things that could happen, negative things that could happen down the road. Uh, but before we do that, since we're just on the topic of, of gold and, and silver, uh, do you feel that that's something that's important for people? Obviously, we're seeing this growth of inequality um, we often talk about that there could be a transfer of wealth that occurred. If we see a pop in the bubble, for instance, do you think it's important for people to have actual physical and to have that out of the banking system? Or is that something that... Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to have just money out of the um, banking system anyway. Uh, <laughs> because, um, you know, and, and, and so so hard assets are, are, are a part of that. And I mean, if you're going to have gold, I think, or silver... Um, like I have physical silver, um, because it, it's it's just real, and obviously you want to make sure it's um, you know, it, it, it it's actually real and it has tracking figures and all of that. But I mean that it's not, um, you know, say ETFs or anything like that, because they just have more of a propensity to be um, moved about by other forces in the market. Whereas if you have something physical, um, it's it's there. Um, so you're, you're storing a physical value. Um, I think that honestly it's the same thing with cash. I mean I. Um, you know, having talked about the savings accounts at the beginning of, of the show with you, you know, I, I don't see any reason whatsoever at all to have any money in a savings account at any major bank. Like, but I see a big reason to have actual money or cash on the side for liquidity purposes, just not in any of of, of the big banks um, because they're not. Well, I mean, because they're just squeezing everybody on their cash, um, whereas they stockpile their cash. So I, I don't really think that's fair. Uh, so. Um, so, so I think, you know, looking at any kinds of assets, it's important to have um, whatever is possible to have outside of the financial system, um, because I think that ultimately um, it gives people um, more of a ability to sort of control their assets um, and, and, and to use their assets um, if, if they need to, whether it's um, to exchange or um, or if, you're, if your asset happens to be, you know, a house and, and not a bunch of blocks of gold or whatever it is that you actually have something of value that, that you can use um, and that you can also um, have outside of the system. And, and have that liquidity. Um, okay, I want to ask you this, um, having read the book and, and, you know, things get shaky. And, you know, obviously, the, the Fed just did what they were put in place to do. But the banks wouldn't have gotten to that position unless Glass-Steagall was repealed. And so the, yeah. the Fed just does what they are in what they were enacted to do. They bail out the banks. They didn't realize that what those consequences could be, not necessarily a year out, but we're 10 years into a new normal. But, um, you know, Winston Churchill once said that, that the Americans never fail to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. <laughs> and so I wonder, do you see that this could go to something very positive down the road that, you know, that the U.S. might get it together and say, okay, we're going to fix all of this? Well, I mean, I think the unfortunate thing about this situation was that the financial crisis, as, as horrific as it was for so many people, did present an opportunity um, to reform the banking system, to return to Glass-Steagall, to return to a separation of, of people's uh, deposits and, and, you know, sort of real loans and, you know, small company loans and so forth relative to more speculative, you know, asset creation, you know, derivatives, extension behaviors of the banks. And, and they, these, these should have been separated, um, like Glass Steagall separated them back in 1933, because that is ultimately a way to require banks to deal with their own risk and make their own decisions and use their own or their shareholders' capital with which to do that and not to rely on. Um, a government or a Federal Reserve or any other kind of central bank to, to bail them out. So though the Fed 
technically did what they were able to do um, under the, the emergency lending clause of the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, which is to provide basically lending of last resort in an emergency, which then became a 10-year uh, long process, um, they did so without limitations. They did so without um, even having their own uh, requirements to decide along the way or explain along the way where this money was actually going and, and what it was actually doing. Um, it created $4.5 trillion worth of money to buy um, government and other assets with from the, the banking system that basically had no strings attached to that money, which they could use for any other purposes. And um, so they lost not just an opportunity to restructure the banking system, they lost an opportunity um, to, to even remotely think about reining in the central bank um, and not allowing that to become like an additional uh, economic or financial hazard going into the future by be like being um, instead of the regulator of these banks, which which it's what well, it's supposed to be. I mean, that's its day job, um, simply being the, the subsidizer of, of banks. And, and, and that's really the problem that we have. So I, I don't know that there's going to be absent another large financial crisis, a, a reawakening. And certainly this Fed is going in the opposite direction of that. It's looking at deregulating banks even further as they are still relying on these multi-trillion dollar subsidies from the Federal Reserve and other central banks um, rather than restructuring them. So, you know, again, I, I, I speak with a lot of um, Congress people on both sides of the aisle um, trying to, to explain that the need to not wait until there's another, you know, massive financial emergency to just look at the signs now, look at, you know, corporate defaults starting to grow, look at the leverage the companies have taken on because the rates have been so cheap, look at how much emerging market debt can blow, look at how, you know, debt to uh, GDP ratios throughout the developed world are all over 100 percent. And just consider the fact that a financial crisis uh, re, you know, caused by the banks again could be really devastating and not to wait. Um, but a lot of them, and this is, you know, this is an issue with politicians in general. They like to, um, you know, to take credit for what they perceive or can spin to be good um, without necessarily thinking about how to plan for the future in case things go wrong. Like that's not what they they do, unfortunately. So you're finding that it's falling on on deaf ears in a way. I'm finding that there's a lot of people who are concerned, and, and there's there's an irony in that because. Um, the conversation I've just had with you that I've had with other um, Congress people on both sides, they, they get, they understand. Um, but but that, that, that gap between understanding and doing uh, remains pretty wide. Yeah, that, I, I can see that. Nomi, I want to thank you so much for being on the show. It was an absolute pleasure hearing your thoughts on, on the economy and, and, and uh, the monetary system. The book is Collusion. The website is nomiprins.com. Uh, people can follow you at uh, Nomi Prins on Twitter. And uh, we hope to have you back on the show real soon. Yes, thank you so much. Well, again, our thanks to Nomi Prince for being part of this today. What a wonderful interview, Jeremy. It was a lot to take in, and I would sincerely hope that people would take the time to listen to it once, twice, maybe even three times, because what Nomi is talking about could, in fact, serve you so well. And as it relates to gold and silver, she's an owner of Precious Metals. She touched on that in the interview. And again, we want to thank her for being part of this. 